Thank you. And uh, thank you guys for coming. I've had an amazing day here at QUT and I'd like to thank everyone who's made it so wonderful for me. Okay, so what I'm going to do today is talk about introduced plant species. And basically what I'm hoping to do is get you guys to think differently about the weeds that are in our natural ecosystems, in our agricultural systems, and in our gardens. And to think about where they might be going into the future. Um, in fact, what I'm going to be arguing is that in the long run, it is inevitable that the introduced species we've got here in Australia are going to evolve to become new, uniquely Australian species. Now, I'm not expecting that everybody will be pleased by me, uh, with me by the end of the uh, <laughs> seminar, but that's okay. I just want to make people think. I've been called a witch for these ideas before, and you can do it again if you like. I quite thought it was funny. <laughs> Okay, so the story really starts over a hundred years ago when the acclimatization societies were still in full swing. And the acclimatization societies, as far as I can work out from the pictures, were mostly old white men with amazing beards. <laughs> um, and these guys worked tirelessly to enrich the, na the native flora and fauna of all of the parts of the world that the Europeans were colonizing. Now, you can already look at these pictures and think, well, maybe not all of these worked out to be such good ideas in the end. Um, but uh, I just wanted to give you one example to highlight how whimsical their reasons for introducing these new species sometimes were. And this is a, an example from America, from Central Park in New York, where somebody was very proud of themselves for having made it through the complete works of William Shakespeare. And they decided that it would be a great idea to try and establish all of the bird species that were mentioned in Shakespeare's works <laughs> in Central Park. So they did this and they introduced them with varying degrees of success. And uh, well, at least one of them was a roaring success and it played proportions. This is the European starling in America. It's also uh, become a major in invader here in Australia. So as a result, oh sorry, and it's not just uh, animals that have been introduced, obviously there are loads of plant species introduced too. And as a result of the actions of the acclimatization societies, um, from introductions for agriculture, for horticulture, and all those accidental ex introductions on that pack of socks and things, <laughs> we now have over 3,000 species of introduced plants present in Australia. And you guys will recognize many of these things. We've got loads of real big name uh, plant invaders. And people worry about these for two main reasons. Uh, people like uh, Tony Abbott and Joe Hockey worry uh, more about the, uh, the dollar bill probably. And they have a huge bill associated with them. They cost Australia over four billion dollars a year. Now that's partly in lost revenues and partly in the control efforts. So it's a really big deal for us. Of course biologists tend to be interested more in the enormous threat that they pose to our native biodiversity. And worldwide, introduced species are thought to be the second biggest cause of declines of native species. And that's second to land clearing, where you just take a bulldozer and you know, completely dig up your native species. So, it's all doom and gloom and they're terrible, but I'm not gonna talk about that side of things today. What I'm gonna, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, and if you talk to most biologists uh, about introduced species, you get an answer that wouldn't sound too out of place coming from these guys. Their answer to what should we do about this? Come on. Oh, it didn't do it. <laughs> they would say it's <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about the doom and gloom aspect today. What I really want to talk about is the fact that these guys with the whiskers inadvertently created this amazing replicated experiment for us. And what they actually did, completely without meaning to, is followed a near perfect recipe for creating new species. Okay, so to explain how this works, I'm gonna to go to sort of biology 101 and remind you how a species forms uh, most often in the natural world. And I'm gonna use this very famous example of the features of the Galapagos Islands.
So generally, what happens is you have a population of your organism, be it birds or butterflies or plants or whatever, and in some way or other, you end up with these, the population divided into two separate geographic ranges. Now, that often happens with mountain building, or in the case of these birds, which aren't very good flyers, they basically got stranded on different islands within that archipelago. Now, once you've got your populations living in more than one different place, then there's scope for them to start to adapt to the local conditions. And that's exactly what happened in the Galapagos. There were different food resources available on the different islands, and the birds adapted uh, their beak morphology in particular so that they were better able to use the different resources that were available to them. So at this point, we've got populations that look really quite different, uh, but to really confirm that they're a new species, most biologists would like you to go one step further and confirm that when you put them back together in the same place, they either cannot or will not um, breed successfully together. So we call that the stage of being reproductively isolated. Now what I'm going to argue today is that this is exactly what we have done with our weeds and that we're well down this pathway. So the first step is geographic isolation. And well, we've, we've got that. We did that in spades. We moved them often from Europe to Australia or from South America to Australia or South Africa to Australia. They've gone some huge distances around the world. The next step is for them to start adapting to the local conditions. And there's two main sorts of selective pressures at play here. The first are the biotic factors, so their other their interactions with other species. Uh, so for instance, a plant that's coming into Australia will have different pollinators, different pathogens, different herbivores, seed dispersers, and will be competing and interacting with a whole different flora of plants. So lots of good reasons for them to be adapting there. And of course, that's just the biotic environment. There's also the abiotic environment. And if you think about just how shocking it must be for a little plant from Europe to arrive in Australia, you can see there's some really good reasons for them to be under pressure to adapt to their new conditions. So what I'm going to do now is show you some evidence that the species that have been introduced to Australia have actually started to undergo changes. And I've reached the point in my career where I'm now just going to be summarising the work of my students. So just to give due credit to them, please don't get the impression I did any work here. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm going to start off talking about a study of 23 species that have been introduced to Australia and 18 species that have been introduced to New Zealand. After that, I'm going to have a look at 12 clonal populations that have been introduced to New Zealand and Australia. Then I'm going to look at three species in England and one species uh, in the glasshouse. And you can see the numbers get smaller here as we go down from sort of broad questions, like how many of these plants are actually changing, to getting at more and more specific questions. And I think you'll agree that this is kind of the piece de la resistance for our lab, um, the glasshouse experiment, really having a look at how different these things are. Now, the first few studies, these four, all used herbarium specimens. Now, there's lots of things to love about studying plants. They're very easy to catch. Uh, you can put a tag around them and you come back the next day and they're still there. I love that. They don't smell bad when you dry them. Um, and you can stick them on a piece of cardboard and leave them in a herbarium for like 120 years, you come back and they look fine. So there's loads of things you can measure about how these plants were grown. So this plantago was collected around about 1880. And so you can get really detailed measurements of what the plants looked like. So we did use that. And the first study uh, was done by Joanna Buswell, who was a Kiwi student who was working with me. Um, and she was working between New Zealand and Australia, doing her master's degree. Now, she looked at 23 species introduced to Australia, and I'm just going to go through the criteria for her study species selection and her methods, um, because this is basically what we've done for all of these studies. So, we were looking for species that were sexually reproducing, that were annual or short-lived perennials, and that were introduced before 1920. So basically, we wanted 
than to have had a chance to go through a decent number of sexual generations um, since they arrived. We wanted things preferably that have been introduced accidentally because that uh, reduces the chance that they've been introduced over and over again, which is quite common in some of the uh, cultivated species. Um, we wanted species that were small enough that they fit on a herbarium sheet. You saw that piece of cardboard. If you study a species that's a little bit bigger than that, then people will be tempted to collect small individuals so that they'll fit on the cardboard. So what we wanted to do was select species that that bias wasn't going to be a problem for. And, of course, we had to have enough specimens. So, um, and we had some data inclusion rules to make sure that the um, replicates were actually decently spread through time. Now, Joanna uh, measured plant height, leaf size, leaf shape, and leaf mass per area, which is a measure of how thick and dense the leaves are, on over 1,900 herbarium specimens. So it was a really big study. And I should say she did this against quite a lot of sort of adversity from the herbarium managers. The herbarium people were saying, but this is an absurd project. Who's your supervisor? You shouldn't be able to do this. Of course they won't have changed. Um, and fortunately, she gridded it out. And even more fortunately, uh, they did change. And in fact, 70% of the species we looked at had changed significantly in at least one trait since they'd come to Australia. So there were some examples of species uh, undergoing rapid evolution before, but we didn't know how common it was. This is most of the species changing, and the changes were often really quite big. So for instance, this clover I'm showing you here had become 60% shorter through that 100 years. It wasn't just plant height, there were other changes, like this medicago, its leaf size is halved, and these species had shown significant changes in their leaf shape. So loads of changes happening really quite fast. Now, of course, the trouble with these herbarium specimens is you can never be sure whether what you're looking at is a plastic response to the environment or whether there's actual, actually been evolution happening. Um, and we thought about this and we looked at a few different things that could have caused us to find plasticity in our, sorry, to misinterpret something as evolution, and we tried to rule them out. So the first thing people often think is, well, of course the species are growing differently. Um, it's different in Australia to how it was in their home range, say, in England. But here's the thing. There might well be a difference due to where they're growing, but we were only measuring specimens that were in Australia. So we didn't measure this. That's not an artifact that's causing us to find that difference. Second thing we wondered is whether we might find a trend in traits through time. So for instance, I've got leaf size here through time um, due to the fact that the species are radiating across a new environment. So for instance, a lot of our species here in Australia were introduced at the coast and have been radiating inwards. And you can imagine with leaf size, with our rainfall gradient, that on the Mesic coast you'd have large leaves just because the environment's nice and wet, in the middle you'd have smaller, and by the time you got out to the arid lands, you'd have really small leaves. And we thought, oh, well, this is a problem. So we uh, included a term for range um, to help account for that variation. And these ranges are determined based on rainfall. You might say, well, why didn't you actually include the proper locations and figure out what the rainfall was at the time? That's because when you look at these old specimens, they've got beautiful copper plate handwriting on them and almost no information. So we couldn't always tell where they came from exactly, but we could put them into broad categories. And when we included a term for range in our analyses, our explanatory power increased markedly. That is, this was um, not um, causing us to think we'd seen evolution when there wasn't a change, it had actually been uh, sort of confounding our results a little bit and made it easier to see those changes. Okay, the third thing we thought about was, well, there's been lots of changes in the last hundred or so years. The changes we're observing in these herbarium specimens might be nothing to do with the species having been introduced. They might be due to global change or changes in local conditions. Uh, such as the land clearing and things. So to look at this, we included a couple of types of control uh, species. Uh, so our main study was on introduced species 
growing in their new range. We included two controls. The first was a native control, and that is native species from this new range growing in the same place that those introduced species were growing. Second type of control we had was a home range control where we had these, home, these introduced species but at home in Europe or wherever they came from and we asked whether they were changing in their home range. And what we found was that there were significantly more introduced species changing than at either of those types of controls. So it's basically not a change just because of the environment changing because otherwise everything would have been changing. Okay, so we can never rule out plasticity with the herbarium specimens, but we were getting pretty confident by this time that it probably was actual adaptive evolutionary change that we were looking at. Um, and remember I said that there was um, real resistance to Joanna doing this study from the people who worked in the herbaria. Um, she actually got the paper published in the Journal of Ecology, which is a really good journal, and it was one of the ten most cited papers published in that year. So that was a really nice thing for her and for me. <laughs> um, Joanna's second study in her master's was on 18 species that were introduced to New Zealand. And basically this was exactly the same as the Australian study. And she measured the same sorts of traits on over a thousand specimens of these 18 species. And in New Zealand, um, she included a term for range that was different. New Zealand's not so low on water as Australia is, but obviously it gets pretty cold down in Dunedin compared to in Auckland, so we included a range term that was stratifying for the big temperature gradient in New Zealand. And the results were really different to in Australia. Only 28% of those introduced species in New Zealand had shown a significant change since they came in. And I can't be sure exactly why that is, but my gut feeling is that because most of these species come from Europe, and this is kind of what their habitat would have looked like in Europe, this is what their habitat looks like in New Zealand, while in Australia, it's a bit different. So basically, I think this makes sense. More species change when we move them from Europe to Australia than when we move them from, New Zealand, uh, from Europe to New Zealand, because the conditions were far more different in Australia. Okay, the next study I wanted to tell you about was done by Rhiannon Dalrymple. Uh, it was part of, it was her honours project that she did with me a couple of years ago. And she studied 12 clonal populations from uh, eight different species in New Zealand and Australia. And she used the same methods uh, that Joanna did. She measured over 1,200 specimens and these asexual species were a really interesting question because the um, asexual reproduction is often a really important trait for successful invaders. If you look at the weeds of national significance in Australia, you find that seven of the 20 of them actually have predominantly asexual reproduction. And it's quite a good strategy for a plant that's invading you can start out in an environment, you don't need to find someone else to have pollen from or whatever, you can just go ahead and reproduce. But the question is, and this is an important question uh, for understanding how they're going to adapt to their new range, does the fact that they're clonal reduce their ability to adapt to their new range? So, Rhiannon started out, and her first question was just, do the asexual populations actually show that same sort of change that we've seen in the sexual populations? And her answer was a resounding yes. Half of the populations showed a significant change in at least one trait. And basically that was big news. This is the first time anyone had said, oh yeah, the asexual species are showing rapid changes as well. So that was pretty cool. But it keeps getting cooler. Our next question was, well, okay, but we know from the theory about the evolution of sexual reproduction um, that sex you know, allows species to recombinate and that, that should help them to adapt, right? So we're, we're expecting to see fewer of these clonal species showing changes through time and also we were expecting the changes to be operating more slowly in those clonal populations. So we did the statistics and 
Basically, there was no difference in the proportion of asexual versus sexual species that were showing significant changes through time, which was a surprise. And there was no difference in the rate of the changes either. In fact, the one that was changing the fastest was asexual, not sexual. Now, that was a little surprising when we started out. But actually, when I looked further at the literature, I realized that this was actually consistent with a lot of what the literature was saying. So when people look at asexual species, they commonly find that the assumption that asexuality is associated with low genetic uh, variation is wrong. A lot of these clonal species have high levels of genetic variation. And what's really cool in plants is the way they do this. Like in an animal, a somatic mutation doesn't really matter much unless it actually affects the survival of the organism. I could have a mutation in my pinky, and, well, that's not going to pass on to my kids, even if I did have any more, which doesn't seem very likely. Um, but in a plant, if you have a mutation in the apical meristem of a branch, as that plant grows, every descendant cell from that mutation carries that mutation onwards. And all of the seeds or whatever it is, bulbs or whatever that get produced from that branch of the plant will carry that mutation. So basically, ace, uh, somatic mutations matter in plants. And one of the other fun things about this is you can have a plant and basically different branches will be actually competing against one another. They'll have different genotypes. So there's this whole evolutionary selection battle going on within an individual plant, which is really quite fun. So another thing that makes plants really quite cool. Anyway, um, these somatic mutations, not only do they actually get passed on to the next generation in plants, but the mutation rates in the uh, somatic uh, tissue are much higher than the mutation rates in um, the germline. Uh, so like three times as high. So I think this might be one of the places that those plants are getting that variation to allow them to adapt. Okay, so that uh, paper has very recently been accepted for publication in Oikos, which it turns out is also a delicious yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the uh, next study I wanted to tell you about uh, was done by Abacuc Flores Moreno, whose name I'm still scared of saying. Um, Abacuc looked at three species in England. And the nice thing about England is that they're amazing record keepers. You know, when they're not tracking trains, they do actually manage to write down and record all sorts of things. And their herbarium records go back an awful lot further than ours, obviously. Um, and so we use these to ask questions about the longer term trajectory of these changes. And the first thing Abacuc did, um, sorry, um, these were the three species he used. And I just want to make the, uh, the point here that um, introduced species, everyone always thinks of them as these ugly, horrible invaders. But an awful lot of them we introduced because we liked them. We wanted them in our gardens. A lot of them are actually quite pretty. Um, the other point I wanted to make here is that these are very long-term records. So this one's the oldest, going back to 1792. 1891 and 1826, so nice long records. And these collections span from right when the species was introduced to the UK to the present, which is just awesome. We couldn't do that here. Um, and basically, Abercook found all three species have changed since their introduction, but that didn't surprise us so much anymore. Uh, we were after different questions at this point. Um, our first question, was what is the shape of change? Do the species start out and change really slowly? Is there like a lag phase in how long in their time to adapt? That's something that people have talked about. Um, do they just change at a constant rate through time? Or, and this is what I thought we'd find, I thought we'd find the fastest rate of change at the start when the difference between where they were adapted for and where they were living was the greatest and that the rate of change would slow down through time. So I thought we'd find this. We did the analyses, and for all three of them, the best fit was this one. So they're just changing at a constant rate. No lag phase, no faster change at the start. They've just been plodding their way through, changing as they go. 
Now the second thing we wanted to know about was sort of the longer term pattern here. Are these species still changing after they've already been there for a couple of hundred years or do they sort of level off and find a new equilibrium? And I thought we'd find this, but did the analyses and two of the three species were showing significant changes still over the last 50 years of the data. So they're still changing. And once again, they're pretty big changes. Now, so we can conclude from this, not only are introduced species changing right from the start, they're still changing hundreds of years later. So this is quite big news. But the thing is, I wouldn't want you to get the impression that they just trucked along changing at a constant rate and are still doing so. Basically, these things were changing and then it changed this way and then it changed this way for a bit. So they were just oscillating around, responding to whatever the environment was at the time. So basically, my conclusion from this is that wherever there's a selection pressure, these things are going to be able to change. OK, the next study I wanted to tell you about, uh, and the final <coughs> one, uh, is run by a PhD student of mine called Claire Brandenberger. Um, now, Claire is a part-time student for two really good reasons there, um, which is brilliant because she's been around for more generations of the plant, so it's worked out really well for both of us. Um, and Claire has been working on Arctotheca popularifolia, which is a little beach daisy, and this is something that we knew from Joanna's work had shown a significant change through time since it had been introduced to Australia. So, what we wanted to do here was have a look at the native population in, they come from South Africa, which is fun because Claire does too, so she'll be able to make lots of good jokes about South Africans invading Australia, um, which I'm not allowed to make. <laughs> um, and she will be um, comparing the South African plants to the Australian populations. Now, most common garden experiments that have done this sort of thing before sample plants from right across the home range. And the thing is, a lot of the weed species that we have here in Australia have huge broad ranges. Like, they'll exist over the entire of Europe and a little bit of northern Africa as well. Um, so the range of their phenotypes within their home range can be enormous. And that can be a problem. Like, if you don't know exactly where something came from, then you'll have very low power to actually determine whether it changed. If you didn't know where this population came from, then you conclude, well, there's no real change. But if you did know where it came from, then you might actually be able to pick up something. So it's really important to do this. Um, so we did that. We, we used uh, microsatellites to locate the exact source population of this beach daisy. And when I say we, I can barely spell DNA. Um, so we had a clever postdoc doing it. This is Leanne Rollins, who's currently working at Deakin. And she found the source population for two species, the Arctotheca populifolia and for Petrohagia. Now, the plan was to grow both of them in a glasshouse, but basically one of our weeds failed to grow, which is always a bit of a win. Um, so we have a study on a single species, which is good because it ended up more manageable anyway. OK, so we figured out exactly where they came from, and we went and collected some seeds, and Claire started growing them up in the glasshouse. And it's a huge bamboo thicket up there. It's an amazing, hugely replicated experiment. And what I want to show you is that there are phenomenal differences between the Australian and South African populations of this plant. We've actually grown them through two generations now. So the first generation, they might be different just because the seeds were formed on plants that were growing under different conditions. That's called maternal effects. You grow them through one generation in the glasshouse, all under the same conditions, and then use the seeds that were made in the glasshouse, and you've taken out that potential confounding. So we've done that, and the differences remain. Oh, and they are quite remarkable. Um, so this is a typical South African plant, and this is a typical Australian plant. And you can see right away that there's a difference in the leaf morphology. And it's a particularly interesting one. The juvenile leaves look pretty much the same, but the Australian populations, the adult leaves look like bigger versions of the juvenile leaves, but in South Africa, they're a totally different shape. So I think this might actually be a neoteny, where the adult has the juvenile form. And that, in Arabidopsis at least, 
was a single genetic mutation to make that happen. So I think that's a thing to look into in the future. Now, not only do the leaves have different size and different shape, um, we also looked at how they were photosynthesizing uh, using ergots and things. And once again, I don't know how to do this. There's another postdoc in my lab at the moment, the wonderful Julia Cook. She knows how to do this stuff. And so we tortured some plant leaves with the machine that measures how quickly they're photosynthesizing and respiring and things. And we found that the native population from South Africa had a higher photosynthetic rate and a lower water use efficiency than did the Australian plants. So some really big differences in some variables that really matter for these plants. Um, we're still gathering data, but it also looks like they've got different flower sizes. So all sorts of things are changing between these two populations. So just to take you back to our little schematic diagram, we've definitely got geographic isolation in a lot of these introduced plant species, and I am certain that we have adaptation to local conditions. So that's got both a good news and a bad news side to it. The fact that they're adapting to local conditions means that our introduced species here are becoming better adapted to living in Australia. They're going to get better and better at growing here and better at invading. So that's kind of bad. We're kind of sitting on a bit of a time bomb in terms of how bad they're going to get. And that's particularly probably true with some of the woody species that haven't had a chance to get through as many generations yet. The good news, though, is that these plants, when we've put them in a new environment, most of them have shown an amazing ability to very quickly make huge changes to how they grow. And I think this might be good news for species responses to climate change. These things, if there's a selective pressure, they're changing. And that is something they're really going to need to do in the coming few decades. So there is some good news. OK, so back to the diagram. Remember, we've got geographic isolation. We've got adaptation to local conditions. Are they turning into a new species, though? To prove that, we have to prove that they're becoming reproductively isolated. Now, that's something that Claire is still working on. She's doing cross-pollination experiments. Um, but I can tell you, there's a difference in their flowering phenology. Their flowers come out at different times. So it very much looks to me like these things are actually starting to speciate. Now, whether they've started to speciate or whether they've actually managed to speciate already or whether they're still in progress doesn't really matter because I think it is inevitable that they will speciate in the long run. And the reason I think this is that with the best will in the world, and we do have a lot of goodwill towards dealing with these invading species, with the best will in the world and all of the GDP that the government wants to throw at this problem, which probably isn't that much under this particular one, um, we, we actually can't get rid of them. Like, if you think about the number of species we've actually successfully eradicated once they've reached the mainland, it's vanishingly small. I think there's only like one or two examples. Um, so if you come back to Australia in 100 years, 1,000 years, 5,000 years, these things are still going to be here. They're still going to be lantana. They're still going to be privet. We don't have any real possibility of getting rid of those things. And the thing is, even the ones that we're working pretty hard on, that we're targeting hard, um, even those we don't have a chance with, but there's all these other weeds that nobody's even trying to eradicate. Nobody's trying to get rid of clover, for instance, because it does some good things and some bad things. So these species will definitely be here into the future. And if they stay here and if they keep changing, then sooner or later they're going to have diverged far enough that we can consider them to be new separate native species. And that's kind of fun because we've, we've had this real uh, mentality of trying to eradicate these things. And if they are unique native species, do we still want to go here? Or is that suddenly something that would be wrong to do? There are species that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. They're only here. Are we going to actually start to protect these things in the long run? So that's something that I think we're going to have to address. And one of the things that I think goes on here with these introduced species is that people 
people get um, very emotional about it. They push a lot of our buttons as a species. And one of the buttons I'm going to show you is the same my team, their team button um, that gets us so excited about uh, things like the sports. Um, and I think this sort of spirit, this will to cheer for our side and eradicate those from the other side, I think that really pushes a, a lot of those buttons. And a lot of ecologists are now saying that this is actually a form of xenophobia when we're looking at these introduced species and being really, you know, kind of irrational about eradicating them. And I'm going to give you two examples now. Uh, the first is where our xenophobia is leading us to commit scarce resources to unwinnable battles. And this example comes from uh, New Zealand, which is my home country. Uh, and the second example is where we blame introduced species for problems that we caused. And we love that one. So I'll, I'll go for an example from Australia for that. Okay, now my first example is, of course, New Zealand's favourite invader. When we look at possums in Australia, they're cute and they're gorgeous and they're fuzzy. And then you look at how New Zealanders see them, and it's funny. <laughs> it's the same species. Um, and one of the interesting things, so New Zealand, as you probably know, spends millions of dollars dropping poison to knock back the possum populations. Now, one of the things I think this is going to do sooner or later is if you keep knocking back these populations by like 90, 95%, they're sooner or later going to adapt to the new uh, conditions and develop a 1080 resistance. So I think sooner or later they're going to speciate too. Um, and I also wanted to just show you the scale of the problem. Now, my, my numbers aren't quite comparable because they're from different years, but possum control in the year 2000 cost New Zealand over $117 million. Now, that's partly from the Department of Conservation and partly from the agriculturalists, but just to put it in perspective, the total Department of Conservation budget for 2012 was $330 million. So it's a massive slice of the total conservation budget. And, you know, we can look back at those guys with the big whiskers now and say, well, they were clearly wrong, but how do you think history's going to look at a nation whose conservationists were all, all out, spending millions of dollars killing these things? I wonder if they're going to question what on earth we were thinking. So, just a thought. Um, but um, more than that is I wonder if we could put the conservation budget to better use. The thing is, these species, they're throughout the entire country. They're in the remotest, most rugged parts of the country. There's no way with just 1080 we're actually going to be able to eradicate them. We can knock them back and give the trees a brief reprieve, but we can't get rid of them. Could we do more good with that much money by allocating it to something else and just accepting that these things are here now? I don't know. OK, my second example is from Australia. And what I'm going to suggest is that we are treating the symptom, not the cause of the problem here. Um, so basically, I'm suggesting that doing bush regeneration is very satisfying, it makes you feel better, but it's like taking an aspirin when you've got a brain tumour. It addresses the symptoms, but not the underlying cause of the problem. Now, the vegetation, uh, when you look at um, the vegetation and where the invasive species are, you find that the vast majority of introduced species occur in areas where something has changed. The disturbance regime, the resource availability, something has changed, usually because humans have changed it, that has allowed those species to outcompete the natives. And the example I'm going to give you is the ecosystem I know best at the moment, uh, which is in Sydney, the lovely sclerophyll uh, shrublands, which are beautiful and diverse. And the thing is, that these things are very resistant to invasion unless there has been nutrient enrichment or a massive change in the fire regime. So we went out um, a few years ago. This was actually the last time I did field work. At the time, I was heavily pregnant. I was thrashing through the forest like this whale. It was awful. <laughs> now, what we did, we found study sites where there was no nutrient enrichment, so we weren't downstream from any uh, stormwater outlets or anything like that. And we used uh, maps of the fires in the last 40 years and quantified how, how many fires there were 
in those 41 years, and we sampled areas with everything between no fires in the last 41 years to nine fires in the last 41 years. And uh, just for comparison, the paleo records suggest that about every 12 and a half years is the natural disturbance regime around there. Now here's the thing, in a place where there's no nutrient enrichment or extra water being added, and where the fire regime was anything like normal up to ridiculously high frequency, the total proportion of species richness that was contributed by alien species was next to none. It was remarkably low. The only places we found introduced species were at these places that hadn't been burned for 20 years or for 40 years. Um, and that same trend was shown with the cover. So in fact, you can see we found one little tiny hypericum with like two little leaves, but it contributed virtually none of the cover in that site. So basically, unless you've seriously messed with the ecosystems, introduced species just aren't a problem. And uh, by the way, I had uh, real help with this fieldwork. I hadn't been outside for a little while at the time, so I took uh, Frank Hemmings, who's a herbarium curator at the University of New South Wales, and he knows every plant and every bird that's ever existed in the planet, so I'm pretty confident <laughs> we didn't miss any although I wouldn't have been confident without it. Okay, so, I think basically in this system, when we pull out the weeds, we're missing the big problem. The problem is that we're adding nutrients to these ecosystems. And nobody's addressing that, or very few people are addressing that with their bush regeneration. They're just pulling out the weeds and it makes them happy. <laughs> so, my question to you is, can we learn from other countries' approaches to introduce species? We're not the only places that have been invaded. And if you look at somewhere like Europe, they've got such a long history of importing interest in things from all around the world, we can look and say, well, what's happened there? And what's happened there is that the people don't care. It blew my mind when I was in New Zealand at first visiting Europe, and these English biologists were like, oh yeah, we introduced this new species, and it's starting to take off across the landscape, and it's cool, eh? <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> um, but the thing is, they don't care. They just go, oh well, it's, you know, it's in here, it's becoming a functional part of our ecosystem, it's contributing to uh, the food, it's becoming a part of the food web, and um, that is becoming a new novel ecosystem. So there's an increasing um, acceptance of novel ecosystems around the world, led by places like Hawaii, where they've realized they've really got so many problems, they actually can't possibly get rid of the weeds. So they're thinking, well, how can we best manage what we actually have? Which I think is a really rational approach, but which, of course, has been hugely controversial. Um, there's also a big movement uh, for people to judge introduced species on what they do in an ecosystem, not on where they come from. So there are introduced species that are huge problems. There are also native species that can cause huge problems. And if we just deal with them that way, rather than saying, well, you're foreign, therefore you're wrong, then we might actually get somewhere a bit better. The other thing that's becoming increasingly uh, obvious is that introduced species will often step in and fill a niche that was created by the extinction of something else. And often that can really help with ecosystem functioning. So in a, a bunch of ecosystems, if you were to remove all of the invaders, there were sorts of trees that went extinct and things because their pollinator got removed. So these introduced species are in many places actually helping keep the native ecosystems as healthy as they can be under their new ecosystem conditions. Okay, so the question of will we ever accept introduced species as native, I know most, most people would go, well, no. But I'm going to give you an example where I think we already have. Um, I'm going to show you three images here. The first is my son a couple of years ago. Uh, he's a second generation Australian. And for some reason, most people seem pretty happy to accept him as an Australian, which is interesting. <laughs> um, the clover. You know, Sam here speaks with an Australian accent and stuff. The clover grows with an Australian accent. It grows differently here. Been here for 130 generations, but we were not willing to accept it as an Australian. Why is that? It's an interesting thing. But here's the last picture. It's a dingo. Now, these things have been here for about 200... Uh, sorry, 2,500 generations. Um, and national. I know there's a lot of controversy about how we should manage dingo populations, particularly with respect to their hybridization with um, uh, 
domesticate dogs. Um, but the thing is, national parks do protect these. They are considered a native species, but they were introduced just 4,000 years ago. So what is it? Do we have to just wait another like 4, 000, another few generations for the clover? Or will we maybe start to accept these things? I'm not really sure. Um, one of the uh, things I read recently was the second verse of the Australian National Anthem, which has always just stumped me whenever I'm on stage and people are singing. I'm like, oh God, <laughs> I don't know these words. Um, but the, the second verse says, um, sorry, we've, uh, for those who've come across the seas, we've boundless plans to share. With courage, let us all unite to advance Australia fair. And I wonder, do you think we'll ever do it with these words? Thank you.